The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to our second webinar in the 2017 Bringing Water to Webinar Bring Water to Life webinar series. My name is Elizabeth McCartney and I'm the Senior Policy and Advocacy Manager with the Irrigation Association. As you can see on your screen, today's webinar is focused on agricultural irrigation in the Mississippi River Basin. We are looking forward to this successful webinar, but before we get started, let's review some quick housekeeping items. First up, this webinar is being recorded. If you want to go back and listen to it, you can go to our website at www.irrigation.org slash webinar underscore series. This is a, uh, a free webinar and the recording will also be freely available and it's going to be posted on our YouTube channel. Second, throughout this webinar, if you have any questions that come to your mind, please go ahead and type them into the GoToWebinar toolbar. I'm going to be monitoring this during the presentations, and we'll be using these questions during our question and answer session toward the end of the webinar. I know that our presenters are looking forward to answering your questions, so please, as they come to your mind during the presentations, go ahead and type them in to our GoToWebinar tool. Lastly, this is also a Tier 1 CEU webinar. Since you registered online, we do have your records on file. However, I do suggest that you keep a record for yourself in case you end up being one of the people that gets audited. Those are the basic housekeeping items. Hopefully that makes sense to everyone. Real quickly, this is the Irrigation Association Strategic Plan. This is our three-year strategic plan that was released in December of last year. Our mission is to promote efficient irrigation with the vision to be the recognized authority on irrigation. We are excited for this webinar to open doors to experts in the industry in the Mississippi River Basin. Uh, it'll be great to kind of create more interest and share knowledge and have an exchange of ideas about what's being done. While a lot of news and conversation within our irrigation industry is focused maybe on California and Nebraska, we do know that the Mississippi River Basin is also home to a large amount of irrigated acreage. So our presenters today are going to be providing their expert insight on the current trends and issues facing irrigated agriculture in this area. Quickly highlight, you know, historically, as I mentioned, we focused a lot on the western United States and also on Nebraska. This is where we see the most irrigated land and the most water use. And you can see that in this map when looking at California and Nebraska having the most irrigated acres. However, I like to look at this next map because it breaks it down by percent of farmland irrigated. And when you look at this, you can see that states in the Mississippi River Basin do have a high percentage of their farmland irrigated. So this is what we're kind of hoping to highlight in this webinar, and we're really happy for all of the attendees that are able to join today. This chart um, or map shows the amount of groundwater used for, for irrigation. It's just interesting to see the different um, ways people get water for irrigation. And then lastly, I like looking at this map because it's going to show the percent change in irrigated acres in the United States from 1997 till 2013. And as you can see, um, this map shows a 53% increase in the amount of irrigated acres in, the, in Mississippi, which is pretty significant. So I think all of those maps are just a great overview to kick this conversation off and show the importance of the important how important it is for the industry to focus on the Mississippi River Basin in that region in our conversations and learning about things. So with all of that said, I'm really excited to introduce you to our speakers today. First we have Kurt Reedus. He's a state conservationist with the Natural Resources Conservation Service in Mississippi. After him, I'll be introducing Paul Rodrigue. He's a supervisory engineer with the Natural Resources Conservation Service in Mississippi. So without further ado, Kurt, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here today, and, and hopefully uh, your uh, participants will gain a bit of knowledge, um, one from the perspective of the technical assistance that we provide to uh, 
the private landowners of Mississippi as well as the uh, financial assistance. Um, first, let me just say uh, the Natural Resources Conservation Service is an agency that is locally led and provides science-based conservation assistance to ag producers within the state of Mississippi and actually uh, nationwide. Uh, we, we have an entity in every state of the nation um, as well as uh, the territory. Um, we know uh, right now uh, that by the year 2050, we're going to have to feed an additional 2 billion individuals. And therefore, conserv conserving our resources is paramount to uh, agriculture as well as uh, the survival of the world. Um, America provides uh, agriculture to the world, and therefore, uh, the strength of America's ag sector uh, will also uh, indicate the strength of the world. Um, and I'll be brief in my discussion so that we can then get into our presentation. Uh, but first and foremost, I want to say uh, the only way the Natural Resources Conservation Service works is through our partners and through the 2014 Farm Bill, we are providing targeted conservation. Um, there is a portfolio of programs available to our ag producers in the nation and those those programs fall under a few categories. One would be working lands. Um, that would include our environmental quality incentive program, as well as our conservation stewardship program here in the state of Mississippi, and as well as our easement programs. Um, those easement programs are under the agricultural conservation easement program, whether it be the wetland reserve enhancement program or the ag land easement program. Uh, the ag land easement program would be one that would be tailored to those individuals that would want to keep that farm for perpetuity, and the uh, wetland reserve easement program would be tailored to those that are uh, retiring marginal cropland to its original state. Um, and we have uh, quite a bit of that going on in, the, in, in, in this part of the state as well. And I'm, I'm proud um, of the work that the staff does with our conservation districts as well as many of our um, governmental partners. Today you're going to hear about the efforts uh, put forth through the Natural Resources Conservation Service and its partners dealing with irrigation assistance. Um, again, water is life. We understand that uh, it is not a uh, infinite uh, uh, resource. Therefore, we put a lot of energy and science behind trying to conserve that resource. Within the state of Mississippi, we work with a few uh, governmental entities in order to do so. You'll see some of that today in our presentation. Uh, one being the Yazoo uh, Water Management District, uh, Department of Environmental Quality, uh, USGS, um, ARS, as well as the Corps of Engineers. We work hand in hand in trying to uh, conserve this resource so that uh, this, this, this state here, um, its main economic driver is agriculture, uh, around 30% of its uh, economic power comes from the ag sector. Therefore, uh, we, we feel that it is important to ensure that we uh, maintain those resources so that we can continue to do so in the future. And we work in partnership to do that. Um, without any further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to uh, our engineer, Mr. Paul Rodriguez. Paul, I'm giving you um, control now. Hopefully you have it. Go ahead. Okay. okay. Is everybody seeing the screen okay? Yes, I see it. Okay, good. Uh, again, good afternoon. I um, appreciate the Irrigation Association's opportunity to tell you a little about, about irrigation in our part of the world. Uh, I'm an agriculture engineer by training, uh, and I've pretty much worked for the last 31 years in Mississippi dealing with the uh, water problems and, and irrigation that we have. <clears throat> I want to begin by continuing 
what we start off with is about this part of the country that some of y'all may not quite be aware of, but about 33% of the land in this area is cultivated in what we call the Mississippi River Alluvial Valley. Uh, it's those floodplains adjacent to the Mississippi River uh, through these states uh, all the way down to the, the Gulf of Mexico. So it really encompasses a, a fairly large area. <clears throat> and with the crop rotations that we have, uh, soybeans, corn, and cotton, and rice are, are principal crops. And based upon the figures from 2007, about 65% of all the rice harvested in the United States then was in this part of the country on about 1.8 million acres. So particularly when you look at Arkansas, uh, they're the number one rice producer. Of course, we all know that it, it tends to be a little bit of a heavy water user. And so Arkansas has dealt with these water issues for a number of years. And uh, in Mississippi, with our increase in irrigation, we've experienced the, the same thing. So with this, uh, actually, you know, we do have the highest percentage of irrigated acres in this region of the country. Uh, and again, that's surprising to most people. Uh, but down here, we, we've seen it for the last 31 years uh, continue to grow and develop. 82% of our systems are gravity feed systems. Of course, over in Arkansas, it's primarily uh, flood rice, and so it's a gravity feed system. Then you get to our poly pipe on our uh, irrigated systems uh, there, and then we've, we've had the center pivots too. So uh, the gravity feed is a large percentage of it. Uh, for instance, we include aquaculture ponds with that, and so those are direct discharge into the, the ponds that we have. So we, we have the full variety of, of irrigation systems and type, and probably just a little bit higher on the, the gravity feed type systems. <clears throat> that information uh, came from our uh, SEEP reports, uh, and that's the reference for those. So now to get a little bit more specific, again, I've worked in Mississippi Delta for, for 31 years, and uh, basically uh, the map up there shows that concentrated area, the alluvial plain, runs from about Memphis down to Vicksburg, from Greenville on the west over to uh, Greenwood on the east, and you see that high concentration of permanent wells. So when I first reported in Mississippi, we, in about 1986, we had just over 2,000 permanent wells. But because of what had been seen in Arkansas and their depletions, uh, the leadership in Mississippi had already recognized that we were going to potentially have a problem in the future. And with the expansions that we've had, and again, up to 2013, it showed 17,000. Well, now we're over 2,000 permanent groundwater wells. Now, one thing that's in Mississippi that is different than many parts of the country, where y'all have riparian rights, rights prior appropriation, all water, both surface and groundwater in the state of Mississippi, belongs to the public. And therefore, any use of that water requires a permit. And then recently, the, the partnership started a Delta Volunteer Metering Program, and we now have about 10% of our wells have flow meters, and those reported to the Mississippi Department of Environmental Quality and the Yazoo Mississippi Delta Joint Water Management District. So the Water Management District was formed in 1988 to provide locally led solutions to the problems that we're facing. So it's made up primarily of the farmers of the Delta working with this organized district, a year into state government, working with the Department of Environmental Quality so that they can make the decisions that are directly going to influence them. But you can see with this high concentration of wells, we've begun to deplete the groundwater, and it's recharged on the west side of the Mississippi by the Mississippi River and on the east side by the Bluff Hills. And so even very early on, the projections from the USGS were that we would exceed the replenishment rate if we did not put in some conservation and take other measures. <clears throat> now about our climate, and the question I always get whenever I travel across the country is why do y'all need irrigation? You know, we do get 55 inches of rainfall, but it predominantly comes late fall, early spring, and winter. We get about 18 inches of that just goes directly into runoff. 
We have about 18 inch growing season deficit, and, and that's our problem. During the growing season, our rainfall becomes less constant, more sporadic, and we get hot, dry weather periods. Uh, and so basically, you're totally dependent at that point upon what you stored soil moisture uh, and any rainfalls that you do get. So irrigation has become more and more important to support these crops. Also, our alluvial soils have high silt contents, and that results in low infiltration capacities. And so even though we get rainfall events, particularly like in the summertime, that one in tens with low infiltration rates, we get high percentage of runoff. So July may have an average of five inches of rainfall a year, but the effect of rainfall, what soaks into the ground, is very low. So even though we get rain throughout the summer still, we, we still have this great need for irrigation. <clears throat> And a little bit different than many parts of the country is because we do have these rainfall events, our farmers are faced with more start and stop decisions. And, uh, and that is proving to be kind of the hard part of, of really making that, that next step into conservation. You know, when do I start, when do I stop? How many irrigations do I actually need? So this map shows uh, the area of the, the delta that is of primary interest. And these shows the groundwater declines that have been taking place uh, as we, we advance in the number of irrigation wells we put in. And that red hot spot uh, borders two counties. And if you notice, it's just kind of geographically located at the furthest point from the two points of recharge. Uh, the alluvial aquifer is overlain by about a 35 foot clay cap. So nothing's getting through vertically. So it's coming in from the Mississippi River on the west coming in from the east from the Bluff Hills, and then from the local rivers uh, that are in contact with the aquifer. So again, what's happening is because of the, it has to develop a gradient to pull the water in, but our aquifer is only about 120 feet thick. And so therefore, we, we have a, a, a thin aquifer. Uh, and so again, gradients needed to pull the water in to give it that flow capacity puts us into a critical spot very quickly. And so just a history, again, you know, NRCS, then soil conservation started back in 1984 on this problem. Uh, had an irrigation team. Uh, we had a water supply study in 1993 through 1998 that general, generated the general outlines for the water management district to try to implement. Uh, since 1984, all of our financial assistance has had a heavy emphasis on water quantity, irrigation water management. Uh, and then we've had two special emphasis areas recently, uh, Mississippi River Basin Initiative, which was primarily for nutrient reduction to the Gulf of Mexico, but we could also piggyback the using uh, water quantity and irrigation savings with that. And then more recently, we've had the Mississippi Water Conservation Management Project, which has provided direct funding to irrigation water management practices uh, over the last four years. And again, that we, we have these soils that are, are just difficult to recharge. Also, we tend to have low organic matter in our soils due to climate and tillage. And of course, we all know that, you know, that 1% organic matter is that sponge that will hold that extra water for irrigation. So we kind of battle that problem, and again, Building all mat organic matter is difficult because of our warm climate, so humid conditions, uh, it tends to burn off about as fast as you can try to, to build it. The, the delta has an average slope of about a half a foot per mile, so it, it, it is very flat. Uh, again, the aquifer is about 100 foot thickness. And again, one of the problems we have is because our pumping depths are shallow, you know, we don't see that big energy cost that helps drive that beneficial conservation. Also, as it stands right now, um, the water is not restricted. Uh, you ask for a permit, you can basically get it still. And so there's no uh, right now real shortage. And, and there's really not a big cost because of our shallow pumping depths. But what we're working towards is we don't want to get to that point where that first pump goes dry. Uh, you know, that, that's a tipping point where then the state local water management district 
runs out of options. So we still have the benefit, which we've learned from other parts around the country, of let's get ahead of the curve, let's put in the conservation, let's improve our efficiency, let's use the other water sources that we have besides groundwater to, to maximize this. So as Kurt mentioned, you know, a lot of what we do is provide financial incentives to adopt conservation practices. And so basically from 2009 to 2016, uh, in all of our programs, Mississippi Delta will spend about $115 million. Uh, money directed towards historically underserved clientele is about $8 million. The Mississippi River Basin brought in about $40 million, and the Mississippi Water Conservation Management Project has brought in about $14 million. So what have we done with this money? Some of the practices that we've used in the Mississippi Delta is looking at water management flow meters. So again, up until recently, uh, flow meters really weren't uh, seen as a tool. Uh, again, because our water was relatively cheap and plentiful, uh, you know, there was really no driving force for conservation. Uh, timers and pump automation have become very popular, irrigation scheduling methods, soil moisture monitoring, tailwater recovery on farm storage. Uh, with furrow irrigation, the, the pipe pipe hole sizing methods like pipe planter, uh, surge valves. Uh, we, we've had some interest in furrow diking, hasn't really caught on here yet. Uh, with flood irrigation, a lot of our rice farmers have moved to zero grade. Uh, those that still have uh, sloping fields use side inlets and rice markers. And then what's being uh, really uh, coming on now is this alternate wetting and drying where you actually take the rice field and, and lose the ponding and let the water table uh, drop from the surface. On center pivots, uh, we work through financial assistance of re-nozzling, putting on drop nozzles uh, to improve the efficiency. Uh, the center pivots we have in Delta originally uh, followed designs from the Midwest. Uh, most of them were on cotton. That used to be the big crop here. They were designed for about a quarter of an inch a day of replenishment, and they worked well. But then when we had to switch to more corn, corn needed a little more water. And so one of the complaints we heard was that the, the pivots just weren't keeping up. And with this renozzling, uh, we were able to do a couple of things that would help improve that efficiency of the pivot a little bit more and make a little bit better use of the water, and particularly with our low intake grade soils. And so, you know, it, we were able to help adjust some of these pivots to be, and now when people put in new pivots, they, they're upping that demand a little bit to a design of about three tenths of an inch an acre. Uh, in both Arkansas and Mississippi, well, we've had large uh, aquaculture ponds. Uh, they tend to always get lost in this whole idea of uh, irrigation, but uh, they were a heavy user. We used to have a lot of acres in the Delta, 150,000 acres. Now we're down to around 50,000. Uh, part of that is uh, improved productivity on each acre. And uh, Mississippi State developed a, what they call the 6-3 management scheme of capturing rainfall uh, with these ponds. So basically what it does is you let the water drop six inches below the overflow point, you pump it up at most to three inches, and that way you always have three inches rainfall capture. And that's the same thing we do with our rice fields. We, with the multiple side inlets, you let each cut dry down, pump it up some, but not fully, so that you always have the ability to capture some rainfall. Because with our flooded fields, the water that falls there you can capture and you get direct benefit from it. The main push in the last couple of years has been uh, Dr. Jason Crutz with the Delta Research Extension Center at Mississippi State University has been doing a lot of field scale work and, and he had came up with this RISER program. And so our partnership in the Delta, very strong, they were able to secure the funding for this Mississippi Water Conservation Management Project and it directly funded the practices that Dr. Crutz was promoting. So the overall irrigation water management, polypipe hole sizing, different irrigation water management devices, particularly soil moisture sensors, uh, you're trying to incorporate some irrigation scheduling, uh, timers are part of this. You know, 
once you decide that I can irrigate a shorter time, making sure you have a timer so that you get that benefit. Uh, one of the real popular ones is remote pump control. Uh, the whole telemetry thing is, is really popular with our, our farmers. And then we hadn't used them in about 20 years, but uh, with Dr. Kutz's work, the surge valves are, are making a comeback with our uh, row irrigated crops. And so we've been able to provide the assistance. He's been able to show the research. And basically, you know, he's demonstrated that easily we can have a 25% savings by implementing uh, the rise of type management schemes. So this graph just shows some of the practices that we've put in by years. Uh, with the irrigation water management, that includes both the payment for managing the systems and then also uh, what uh, we would do for uh, probably paying for your soil moisture devices and, and those things. You see the number of flow meters we put in, so it was very timely that with the Delta uh, voluntary metering program, uh, we were able to get this funding to help the farmers actually put these uh, into place. Again, the pump automation has been very popular. Uh, you know, there's been a few little problems and tweaks, uh, but uh, the farmers really like being able to, to monitor and control those things. Just knowing that, you know, at any point they may be five miles away from a well, but they can still check on it. Again, the surge valves have had a certain level of interest that's been maintained throughout the program. Uh, the pivot renovations uh, have uh, become more and more popular. Uh, and again, we've, we've kept trying to stress that uh, you know, by re-nozzling, uh, they can extend the life of these pivots and continue to get that high water conservation benefit because, you know, basically we all know that, you know, they're the most conservation benefit system out there, uh, you know, by, by far. So looking at the number of practices that we've done under this program, you can see these numbers here. And again, uh, you know, the flow meters, uh, we put in about 10%. So uh, the total in Delta was about 2,000 uh, meters total that we'll put in, and we're continuing to keep that number uh, increasing year by year. Uh, the Mississippi River Basin uh, program was meant, again, for nutrient reduction, but the counties on the left-hand side, the gray area, show the, the actual watersheds that that funding was available for. And you see the central part basically overlaid where our hot spot was. And so since we were trying to do nutrient reduction, keep sediment and nutrients from leaving the farmland and going down to the Gulf of Mexico, one of the ways we could think we'd do that easiest was by capturing water off the farm. And again, with 55 inches of rainfall, 18 inches of direct runoff a year, uh, that was one that we, we thought was easy hanging fruit that would get us you know, two birds with one stone. We could address nutrient reduction and at the same time address alternative water supplies. <clears throat> so with Mississippi River Basin Initiative, we focus a lot on tailwater recovery and, and on-farm storage reservoirs, building large reservoirs to capture winter rainfall uh, runoff, spring runoff before the crops are planted, stored in the reservoir, and then use them in the summertime for irrigation purposes. And uh, so again, doing that run that we had with that, uh, again, we put in a, a fair number of reservoirs. They are expensive projects. They were required to use it only on ag land. Uh, and so people had to give up production land to put it in. Uh, but on a 25 year return basis, uh, basically the practice will pay for itself, if nothing else, and reduce pumping costs. And even though we have low pumping costs to begin with, using surface water, that reduced energy requirement uh, is a significant savings over the long term. As part of all our plans with the Natural Resources Conservation Service, we have to do an irrigation environment plan. And one of the things that we really want people to look at, particularly when they start using soil moisture sensors and other devices, is to understand these soils. You know, our agency has always promoted the use of soils information for a long time, but still is one that's kind of not commonly used. And here we're really having to develop a sense of what our soils are in relation to soil moisture. 
you know, what's going to be available to that plant. And again, it's kind of a cutting edge uh, for us here in the Delta. To show what we've been able to accomplish with some of these practices, uh, we looked at about 45 systems, and what we saved was about 11,000 acre feet. And so again, we, we took that off of the groundwater demand by using these on and storage reservoirs, tail water, and surface water systems. And because we do have a plentiful amount of rainfall in the off season, we also have a fair number of surface water bodies to various rivers. Again, we do have the potential to switch many areas from groundwater to surface water. And again, these systems show that, that great potential that's there. And again, we, we can still do more. Again, I've mentioned the, the pivot renovation, uh, keeping these pivots going, re-nozzling them is part of it and then putting on these drops. Now, we really don't have the, the wind and evaporation problems that you experience in other parts of the country, but what it does is it, it, the combination of new nozzles, putting on the drops, and then particularly the way we require in Mississippi is you have to alternate the nozzles from side to side. And what that does is increase the wetted diameter, therefore it reduces that instantaneous infiltration rate. And so if we can get it down lower, then it tends to meet our restrictive soil intake rates. And so, uh, you know, this practice has made these pivots, you know, just perform better, has given them a few, few more years of life. Uh, and so, again, we're keeping this very highly efficient system in place uh, because otherwise we've seen in the past some people take their pivots down, convert to surface irrigation. You know, we go from a 90-plus efficiency to basically a 65% efficient system. So, so we're doing all we can to try to keep the, the pivots in place. Again, something that takes advantage of two things, uh, tail water recovery systems. Uh, you know, most places you're capturing just return flows from irrigation. Here, again, we also have the ability, you know, you're irrigating, thunderstorm comes in, rains, you turn off your irrigation, we can refill also from, from surface runoff from rainfall. So our tailwater recovery systems actually get used even more than just from the tailwater uh, return. They, they capture stormwater. And we design a, about a 12 acre foot of storage for 40 acres, do one irrigation, and we have to have about 120 acres of irrigated water coming in if there's no rainfall events that occur to keep the, the system going, supply the tail water. Our large on-farm systems, we make about one acre of storage for each 16 acres of, of row crop, have about an eight foot depth, and again, we, it's used for tail water. The tail water is what temporarily detains the storm water runoff during the winter time, then we pump it into the storage reservoir, and again, fill that up during the winter time, and then in the summertime, this water is from the reservoir is used to replace uh, the water that would normally from, come from groundwater. And with a properly sized reservoir, basically eight out of 10 years, you won't use groundwater. Two years out of 10, uh, you still have to use some groundwater because we're in an extreme drought condition. One of the constant fears that some people have about these reservoirs is uh, wave action on the on the levees because these are embankments that we're building. You know, we have a flat delta. We don't have any terrain to take advantage of. So these are all dikes that are built up eight feet tall. So Arkansas, way back, had started putting on berms, letting them grass up in water flow. Well, when we started building in about 2009, in Mississippi, one of the things we did is we added what you see in this picture here, and that's an overflow pipe at that berm elevation. Because we do get rainfall, if you're full, the water's right at the berm, it's doing a good job with the wave action, and then you get a four inch rain. Well, all of a sudden that water comes up four inches. That water has no way to get out. It attacks that berm at a different elevation, it attacks that levee at a different elevation. And, and it erodes. So by putting this pipe here, we can draw that water back down and prevent that levee action. And it, it's worked exceedingly well so far. 
This is just an area view uh, from the Water Management District uh, of one of our tailwater recovery systems. Uh, one of the things that the state did to promote conservation several years ago was, you know, I said earlier that all water in Mississippi belongs to the people. And so basically that's true, except they made an exception. If water falls on your field, it gets into your farm ditch, and you capture it before it commingles with any other water. You can capture it, store it, and use it without a permit. And so that gives a little bit of that independence to that landowner. But once you commingle your water with anybody else's water, then it becomes public again. So that helps a little bit with these tailwater systems. So that's an example of just a tailwater system. Again, we, we designed it to do one 40-acre field, one complete irrigation, and you have to have three fields that are being irrigated from groundwater to put it in. And again, you end up reducing your groundwater by about 20 to 25 percent. This is an aerial view of one of our large on-farm storage reservoirs with an adjacent tailwater. And here it's in rice, graded rice. Uh, and again, all the water that comes off these fields from any source, rainfall, irrigation, goes into the water recovery system, can be picked up, put into the storage reservoir. And again, the reservoir is typically sized so that in most years, you can do 100% irrigation from it. Uh, and again, two years, you can't get rid of your well, because two years in 10, you know, the drought's going to be so severe, you're going to need that additional water. Uh, and basically, we keep growing our ag irrigated acres because uh, we do get these dry periods. And, you know, it's just like everything, lending, getting that loan for your farm. If you're not irrigated, uh, it's hard to do. So we imagine that we're going to be basically 100% irrigated on our crop plan before long. On the right-hand side of this picture is the Sunflower River, and again, taking advantage of these flows that we have in our natural streams and rivers uh, to, to reduce that demand. Uh, so we had this situation as put in, and, and basically uh, this farmer has not had to use his groundwater well uh, since he's put in the surface water pump out of the Sunflower River. Uh, the Sunflower is one of our bigger internal drainages in, in the Mississippi Delta. So those are some of the general conservation issues that we've been doing. And in that, in the Mississippi Delta, we have a couple of ongoing projects, uh, and that is we're going to uh, put uh, low flow. We have a problem with low flow in the Sunflower River after the irrigation season. <laughs> and so the water management district has to pump water into the river to prevent it from going too dry. And that's because, again, it's lost its base recharge. The aquifer is no longer in contact with it. And so that was part of a, a project that we studied, YMD implemented. And so, again, it's just to keep making sure that when we get to our driest period of our year, which is September and October, that the river can meet water quality standards. Uh, the Water Management District also does a semi-annual water level survey. USGS is doing groundwater modeling. Uh, projects that are being looked at is using the Mississippi River as a water source. Uh, we're looking at a, a tr transfer from the Tallahatchie River, which is on our east side, has a little bit more consistent flow, and transferring that over to the adjacent basin, Quiver River, which is in the central part, that red hot spot that I showed you. So again, everything right now is about getting more water, more conservation into that hot spot. Uh, also, ARS, USGS, and Water Management District is looking at a groundwater injection. And again, that's taking water from the east side of the delta where the water lip is plentiful and more recharged and bring it into the central so that, again, it doesn't have that slow process of flowing through the uh, aquifer itself, it'd be a direct injection. And, and that seems to have a considerable promise. So those are some of the things we're doing, applying the conservation first and foremost. But then we also recognize, based upon USGS modeling studies, that we're going to need to bring in these alternative water supplies also. So with that, that's the completion of my presentation. Be glad to answer any, any questions that may be out there. Thank you so much, Paul. That was wonderful. And thank you, Kurt, as well. So I have a few questions that came in. I hope others are aware 
on the GoToMeeting uh, toolbar. If you see where it says questions, you can type in any questions that you may have. I'm sure Ms. Curtin would love to answer any of your questions. So our first question is, um, how about subsurface drip? I think you mentioned pivot a few times, but have you seen any farms using these type systems? For our row crop situations and our, our soils, the, the subsurface drip uh, it would tend just to be problematic. With our soils, we still do a lot of, of subsoiling. Uh, we had one farmer several years ago that that tried it and just had a, a, a number of issues. We also have a very, very, very high iron content in our water, uh, which is also tend to be problematic with the drip. So mostly we see the drip limited to, to specialty crop, uh, some of our uh, orchard crops, you know, upper corn orchards and those types of things. Oh, I'm sorry, I was on mute. Uh, the next question is, have you seen a significant shift to other forms of irrigation in recent years, or is it mainly focused on maintaining management practices, or have you seen maybe gravity going to center pivot in recent years? We're pretty much stayed uh, consistent uh, with the, the gravity feed as the primary. Uh, we, we're seeing a, a, a a little bit of interest in going from the traditional furrow to a little bit more of a, a border type irrigation. Uh, center pivots, now that people have understand the dynamics of it, uh, people are a little more willing to look at the, the pivots than they had been for a while. Again, there was perception. It wasn't anything wrong with the pivots. It was just a perception they had. They didn't understand what they had been designed for. But right now, I'd say for the foreseeable future, uh, we're going to maintain with the, the flood and furrow uh, being our principal irrigations. Uh, and again, it'd be nice to significantly increase our center pivots because that would make a real big dent in our, our groundwater depletion. So again, our focus right now is on the management, increase the efficiency of those surface systems, and then introduce as much as possible alternative water sources to groundwater. The next question, uh, is there a big challenge with dealing with recharge and replenishing aquifers? Do you feel that there have been any successful projects from any of the funding initiatives to do this? On, on recharge, you know, if we talk about more of a passive type recharge, uh, the Corps of Engineers has looked at putting in the possibility of weirs and more of our channels for those that have connectivity to the aquifer. Again, part of our issue is with our sediment, uh, high silt contents, uh, the channels also tend to, to kind of clog up. A 35-foot clay cap pretty much prevents general aerial recharge. And so that's why uh, ARS and USGS and Water Management District are looking at this more direct injection, take water from where uh, we have it as plentiful, it won't hurt water table declines, pipe it over and inject it uh, into to that hot spot and, and create the recharge to a more active recharge system. Great. So one of our last questions is coming up, but I hope others can, oh, I just see a few more coming in, so that's great. The next question, you mentioned that Two out of 10 years, you expect to be in extreme drought conditions. Is this a trend that's expected to hold up, and is that how kind of the planning is going to prepare for those similar situations in the future? Yes. Um, the, based upon the, uh, the, the climatologists at Mississippi State University and their long-term work, uh, when, when they help propose some of these ideas of the six three method with catfish ponds and, and these you know, they evaluate how effective these reservoirs could be. That that two and ten tends to stand up long term. 
uh, you know, again, we always have to put the caveat in there that, you know, we never quite know what uh, global climate change may do in the future. But as it stands right now, the trends we see, that, that 2 in 10 uh, pretty much stands uh, that we know we're going to be in extreme dry periods uh, in, in, in that kind of frequency range. Great. So the next question is, with the increase in on-site water capture, is there any concern about the reduction of available surface water downstream or lower river velocity or depth? Yes, as the question is identifying, there's always this, this trade-off. And so, yes, when we capture that water, that's less water that's flowing downstream. <clears throat> now, one of the things that, you know, we've seen is over in Arkansas, uh, where they were very uh, leading in this region on capturing service water, uh, they, you know, brought to the extreme where they basically have to import now. They, they're already using their surface runoff. Uh, and, and in Mississippi, though, our Department of Environmental Quality is always going to ensure that our streams have sufficient low flow in them. So we could get to the point, we haven't had that kind of level of development in any one particular watershed, but yes, there would be that trade-off point where, you know, for fish and wildlife uses, they would say, you know, enough's enough. But but I think we are we are a long way from getting to to that point. But that is a possibility. Well, I don't see any more questions coming in. I'm gonna uh, answer one housekeeping question that was asked. So not for Paul or Kurt, but someone asked about the CEUs and your records for that. And they asked what would count as a record. So your, con your confirmation email for this webinar will suffice if you are audited. Uh, that's what our education and certification team have told me. So as you can see on the screen, you have uh, Kurt, Paul, Kurt and Paul's email, and you also have mine. So if you have any questions as we're wrapping this webinar up and in the next few weeks, feel free to email any of us. And as I mentioned, this webinar will be available on our website and on our YouTube page. And then we have a few future webinars. So as we mentioned, the Bringing Water to Life webinar series. This was uh, the second webinar in our five-part series in 2017. We have another webinar coming up on June 20th. And then on June 29th, we have a, another agriculture webinar about telling a positive story about irrigated agriculture. We're really excited about that one and hope that people can join again, and that one also, uh, CEUs will be available for that as well. So I'm going to go ahead and close out this webinar. Again, thank you so much to Kurt and Paul for your participation, and we hope to have uh, attendees on this one join many of our future